Sounds good. Uh, thanks, Adam. Good evening, everybody. Hope you all are doing well. Um, it's my pleasure to be here on OD Wire for another uh, a webinar this evening on revolutionizing glaucoma management with uh, OCT and OCTA technology. I want to thank the folks at Visionics. I'm sure most of you know who Visionics is. If you don't, uh, I'm sure all of you have heard of OptiView before. OptiView and Leno Technologies, they kind of merged. Uh, and formed the company called Visionic. So uh, this will be all on OptiView's new Solix OCT and OCT angiography. And I'll tell you a little bit about my history uh, in just a little bit. Like Adam said, I'm at the Oklahoma College of Optometry in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, where I serve in a variety of roles, one of them being our chief of specialty care clinic, which is where we do our advanced diagnostics, laser procedures, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we are talking on glaucoma management with OCT and OCTA technology. I've been, I've been very fortunate. And before we get into that, um, we're going to see some polling here in just a little bit. So I'm going to get to that polling in just a second. I've been very fortunate to um, to have a, a longstanding relationship with OptiView. I've had a number of their OCTs. And back in 2000. Uh, 18, late 2018, they contacted me and said, hey, we've, we've got a device called the Solix OCT uh, and we have to do normative database trials. And, and so we had to recruit a bunch of, of normals. And obviously being at an optometry school, we've got a bunch of students and residents and faculty and staff and loved ones of all of those students, residents, faculty and staff. So in the spring of 19, we got to be of, of one of five sites to establish the normative database or the reference database for the Solix OCT. Obviously, COVID then happened in 2020. They contacted me again in 2021 and said the FDA is asking for um, another study, a, basically a repeatability and reproducibility study. So I got to be involved in a second study with the Solix comparing it to the previous version, the Avante, which we had had for five, six, seven years at that point. So bottom line is I have been familiar with the Solix since early 2019, and I'm super excited that it is now FDA cleared on the market because we have been just shaking our heads going, wow, is this device phenomenal? And it is going to just revolutionize how we manage OCT, OCT angiography. I know all of you are familiar. I bet most of you have OCTs. There's probably a smaller number that have OCT angiography to now have FDA approved metrics for OCT angiography is a game changer uh, to be able to measure that peripapillary capillary network, which we know is affected in glaucoma. It's just it's just been an amazing ride and seeing this device from the first trial to the second trial and now having it in our clinic and scanning it on actual patients, not subjects anymore from the trial, but at, for the trials, actual patients. So it's been awesome to see. Really excited to talk with you guys about the Solix and specifically glaucoma management. So if you've been to my lectures before, you know I like to poll the audience. Um, I'm going to go through at least one case tonight, maybe two if we have time, and I'm going to ask you guys various questions, um, and nobody likes to raise their hand. It's obviously impossible to do on a virtual uh, lecture, but I like to kind of see what how the audience is thinking for these various answers, and this is completely anonymous. Nobody will know what you put. I won't even know what you put, um, but it's a nice way to see which way the group is leaning. Again, no individual answers. So let's open up that first poll, Adam. And my first question is an easy one. Uh, do you see, manage, or treat glaucoma patients? And the answer is yes um, or no. So let's go ahead and see what you guys think here for that. Do you see, manage, treat glaucoma patients? Um, and I think the polling is open. Adam, I don't need to do anything for this, do I? Nope, nope. You just tell me when you want me to close the poll and I'll close it and we can uh, get the results. Okay. So obviously many of us see glaucoma patients. When I asked this question, I just asked this at a meeting in California this weekend that I was speaking at uh, and asked the question and it was 88% of people say uh, they see glaucoma patients. So usually it's between 85 and 90%. It's not going to be 100% because all of us see and have different interests, whether it's ocular disease, whether it's low vision, whether it's vision therapy, whatever it is. And that's awesome. Optometry is a nice, broad profession. So let's go ahead. Do you see, manage, treat glaucoma patients? Yes or no? 
And Adam, let's see if we can see our results. Yep, and so let me, uh, if you guys can't see the results on the screen, I'll actually just verbally tell you. So 89% of people said yes, 11% said no. Pretty darn close to California this week. And again, that answer is always between 85 and 95%. My point is, is the vast majority of us see glaucoma patients, manage glaucoma patients, and probably treat glaucoma patients as well. And I always start with this slide. You know, glaucoma is truly uh, a, a puzzle. We are adding up a puzzle and putting a puzzle together from both a diagnostic perspective and a treatment perspective. I wish there was a perfect treatment for glaucoma. Is there a drop, a laser, a surgery that's going to cure glaucoma? The answer is not. We cannot cure the disease. We manage the disease. We try to prevent progression. We want to try to delay progression as much as we can. What's the ultimate goal in glaucoma? To prevent vision loss. To have the patient die at 95 years old or beyond with usable vision still. So we have a lot of different tests, whether it's visual field, whether it's OCT, OCT angiography, obviously our main modifiable risk factor, which is IOP, corneal thickness or pachymetry, corneal hysteresis, family history, ERG, we add up a lot of different tests. I'm guessing every single one of you when in your glaucoma patients asks about family history. You check their pressure. You're doing visual fields, which are standard of care. And I would argue OCTs are standard of care as well. Probably pachymetry, again, as we talked about. So you're adding up a bunch of different pieces. And OCT has certainly become standard of care over the last 15 to 20 years, uh, and it's revolutionized how we look at retina and how we look at the optic nerve and glaucoma as well. So it's a puzzle, and we've got to add up all the pieces. Well, the pieces are getting better and better and better, more advanced, more efficient, better scanning, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight when it comes with this Solix. So if you haven't heard of the OptiView Solix OCT, next time you're at, your, at a conference, whether it is your state association, a local meeting, a national meeting, AOA coming up here in June in, in Washington, D.C., the Academy uh, in New Orleans in October this year. So whether it's a, a national meeting, a regional meeting, a local meeting, next time that you see the OptiView or Visionix booth, go take a look at this Solix device. Again, I've had my hands on it since January of 2019 with the trials, and it is so slick when it comes to scan acquisition. Um, the ability to get in through undilated pupils better prior to uh, compared to previous uh, versions of OCTs. It is just slick as can be. And you're going to hear me this, to say this at the end, but also at the beginning. It's now nice to have kind of a one stop shop. What do I mean by that? We've got OCT. We've got OCT angiography. We've got fundus photos in this. We've got anterior segment photos built in, mybography photos. You can take pictures of the meibomian glands. And you've got your pachymetry, your corneal thickness, um, epithelial mapping for dry eye. You've got a lot of different things in this instrument. Again, I'll show more pictures of that in just a second. So when it comes to the glaucoma protocol, obviously, we want to detect glaucoma. There is different ways that we can manage this from the wellness perspective. You cannot treat glaucoma until you diagnose glaucoma. So we've got to be able to detect that sooner. We'll get into wellness in just a second. We will get into the ways that this is more efficient, more accurate, more effective in scanning our glaucoma patients. And then obviously, as you see these patients visit after visit after visit after visit, and you scan them again and again and again and again, I want to know, is there progression occurring? What's the definition of glaucoma? A progressive optic neuropathy with the main modifiable risk factor being IOP, and we're looking for visual field changes, OCT changes, as well as structural changes on the optic nerve. But in the definition is a progressive optic neuropathy, and we need to be able to easily detect progression. These new advanced scans with the Solex, much just a great way to detect progression. So let's go through these yeah, very quickly, each one of these, the early detection. Again, the wellness or the angio wellness. Again, we're talking about both OCT as well as OCT angiography. So your wellness scans, what does that mean? These patients are not your pathology patients. They are not your diagnosed with glaucoma patients, diagnosed with diabetes patients. They're you're your primary care patients. Again, you're doing a wellness exam and you're trying to detect earlier, detect sooner. Again, you cannot treat glaucoma 
until you diagnose glaucoma. And earlier uh, diagnosis is going to lead to likely better long-term outcomes for these patients. So in these eye wellness scans and angio wellness scans, you are looking at a nice picture of the retina, which gives you your ganglion cell analysis. As we all know, RNFL changes now precede visual field changes. Gone are the days where we rely on visual field defects to make our diagnosis of a glaucoma. That was 25 years ago. We know that there is pre-parametric glaucoma. Before your patient has visual field defects, they have defects on the retinal nerve fiber layer. Now, let's take it another step further. RNFL changes are before visual field changes. We now have ganglion cell changes before RNFL changes. That is supported by the literature as well. Probably an earlier change, before they have RNFL defects, many of your glaucoma patients will have ganglion cell defects as well. So it makes sense on these wellness scans, trying to pick up the earliest signs of glaucoma, you've got ganglion cell analysis. Ganglion cell analysis. So a quick retina scan, you've got ganglion cell analysis. Does everything look good or are we showing early changes? And at the same time, we've also got the... Um, we've got this cap, the vessel density in there as well. So is there any early changes from diabetes, diabetic retinopathy, which is obviously not the topic of tonight. We talked about that more last fall, but some of your earliest changes seen in diabetic retinopathy can be detected on OCTA, enlargement of the foveolae vascular zone, dropout of those macular capillary beds. You get capillary dropout those can be detected before MAs, before hemorrhages, before cotton wool spots. So my bottom line point is your early diagnosis here. We're looking for glaucoma as soon as we can get it with those ganglion cell changes. And we've got those retinal scans as well. Your eye wellness, your angio wellness, the goal to pick it up as soon as possible. Earlier diagnosis leads to earlier treatment and better long-term outcomes for those patients. How about efficient assessment? The Solix compared to previous versions of the OCTs, it's got a new reference database. Again, I was part of developing that reference database and these newest OCTA vessel density metrics. Again, the only one that's FDA approved at this point. And this is much more efficient and accurate than before versus previous technology like the RT view or the Avante, which we have the Avante and have had it for about seven years now, eight years. You would take 12 radial line scans and 13 concentric rings. So you're scanning and scanning and scanning in this radio pattern with concentric rings, which was awesome. But now you're talking 512 uh, B scans, the resolution much, much better, three times better. And let me, here's a picture to drive home this point. You know, when you take talk on these 12 radio line scans and concentric skirt circles versus all of this efficient and more accurate scanning, there is a picture of a shark and Nemo, and Do I think it's Dory, I think her name is the blue one, um, on both of these pictures, which one can you see better? Which one are you losing some details? Well, obviously we are seeing the shark and uh, Nemo better on the right one where you're scanning more efficiently, you're scanning more accurately, the resolution is better, there is just more scans so you're gonna get more data and you have it more efficiently versus again, nice technology over here. You can see portions of the shark, but you can't see the entire picture. The entire picture becomes more apparent when we have more scans and better resolution. That's kind of what's going on with these scans here. And I'm gonna go through this printout in just a little bit, but the take home point is the resolution, the repeatability, the reproducibility, the ability to see subtle changes is three times better. It's went from like 2.2 microns down to 0.7 microns. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Back in the days of the earliest OCTs, like in the late 90s when it was just being developed and studied, it was like 20 microns. And then it got to high definition OCT, and then it got to like five to 10 microns in the late 2000s over the past decade. And now it's down to in the two, three microns down to 0.7 microns. The resolution just getting better and better and better. The r and three times better than it was uh, compared to previous OCTs. And again, it gives you, going back here, it lets you see the complete optic nerve picture 
or the complete macula picture that much better and it does it in even more efficient manner. So that's what's going on here. We'll go through those printouts in just a little bit. There's enhanced metrics. You know, we were all familiar with yellow, with, excuse me, with green, yellow, and red, the stoplight pattern. Green, generally speaking, good. Yellow borderline, red is bad. The green, yellow, red, the, they have now added in a an additional color or two. Instead of actually having five, you can see we've got red, uh, yellow, green, blue, and dark blue. There is now an additional color, orange with lines and light blue with lines. And what that is, is it gives you another color in between yellow and red. You know, red scares us. When we see red, it's like, what is happening? What's Why is there red on this? It could be normal, but the chances are very, very low. It's called red disease, um, but it gives you a better opportunity to say, you know what? I don't want as much red. It, we've eliminated some of the red and some of the yellow and combined it into orange. So it gives you seven different colors now. It basic, basically gives you a more enhanced uh, normative database or reference database. So if you see orange, it's in between yellow. It's a little worse than yellow, which was in the past I thought of as borderline, and it's a little better than red. So orange is in between yellow and red. Um, and in glaucoma, so it indicates green is normal, yellow may be borderline thinning, again, generally speaking, and red is more significant thinning. Orange is going to be right in between that. So it's going to be in between the yellow and the red. Uh, in glaucoma scans, optic nerve head scans, in your retina scans, the scale is going to be blue because as the retina gets thinner, you go from green to, to light blue to dark blue. So blue with lines means in between the light blue and dark blue. So the bottom line is, is it's a more efficient, more accurate color scale instead of five colors. There's now going to be seven, which helps to reduce red disease, which means the OCT is red, but it's not disease. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, so it gives you really better intervals and enhanced uh, reference database metrics there. So again, it scans more efficiently. It does this in a better manner, and it's got better progression analysis. So be able to look at these scans and go and is this progressing? Is it not? Give me an idea if this glaucoma is progressing or not. So again, advanced scanning of the optic nerve, looking at is this changing over time? We'll go through some printouts here uh, in just a little bit. The bottom line is these scans are less affected by scan position. They're less affected by eye movement. They're less affected by tracking speed. This The device now, it can just easily track and lock on going, okay, that's where I scanned before, even if we're a little off center. If the scan position is a little off center, if they're moving their eyes a little bit during the scanning, the acquisition is much better. The artifacts are reduced better. The tracking speed is better to give you better data scan after scan after scan, which helps with progression uh, detection. So you can see here, when we take a look here, visit after visit after visit after visit, it will lay those right on top of each other. And you can see the retinal nerve fiber thickness with the reference database as we'll go over in just a second. So you can easily compare one visit after the other. We've got the right eye, we've got the left eye. There's your retinal nerve fiber layer. The ganglion cells just below that. Um, we've put on the deviation map here, which is what I like to look at or how I like to look at it with the deviation map. So you can see, again, is this progressing? Is this deepening over time? Any ganglion cell thinning? And then I really like these plots down here where it shows right eye and left eye, the superior RNFL, the inferior RNFL, the average RNFL, uh, and then the hemis as well. But how are we trending over time? Are we pretty stable? Which is what these scans are showing us. We're not deteriorating over time compared to age match norms. We all know that our we're going to deteriorate over time just from age. Is this deteriorating more than just the standard aging? Is pathology going on? In this case, this looks great. No signs of progression, but really like to lay that visit after visit after visit, as you can see on the top uh, right there. So again, we've got those scans on the top, the RNFL. Uh, I've unchecked the box on this one. So again, you're not seeing the reference database. My preference, notice there's no colors uh, here. You can't see any colors on this because we've unchecked this box here, the reference database. I prefer it looks like the previous one. Notice this reference database box has been checked. 
And now we've got these numbers all compared to the reference database. So we can see our colors, the greens, the yellows, the oranges, and the reds, as we talked about before. I like that. Again, you can use these. So it's the beautiful thing about this Solux is you can customize so many different things. Um, there you go, turning on the, the, the reference database. Uh, and then we also turned off the deviation map here. Notice the deviation map. We are not seeing it in this row right here compared to my preference is having the deviation map on. So you can see the ganglion cells as they're deviating from age match norms. And is that deviation increasing over time? Obviously, if the deviation is increasing over time, that becomes more concerning. So just a couple of these protocols here. Again, the RDB database, that's the colors uh, on the RNFL. And then the deviation map, that's the colors on this row right here, the ganglion cells. I like both of those boxes to be checked so I can get this printout just like that. But it's your preference. Whatever you prefer, here both of those boxes are unchecked. So we're not seeing the colors and we're not seeing the deviation. And then you've also got the disk parameters. Take a look at the disk parameters with symmetry analysis and the ganglion cell parameters uh, with symmetry analysis as well. So again, kind of your one-stop shop. What's this looking like over time? I've got pictures of the nerve and then I've got my plots, these graphs and the plot thicknesses over time. Again, I hope all my glaucoma patients look just like this. We are not trending downhill here. Looks great in that particular case there. So again, I think we've covered this as well. Um, there's AngioView disc trend analysis, where again, you can look in this uh, from the disc, visit after visit, or as you can see in this one, and it's hard to see, here's the first one, here's the most recent one in the right eye. Here's the first one, here's the most recent one in the left eye. You know, you've got a bunch of scanning and you just, you tell yourself or you say to yourself, I just want to know if today's scan, has it progressed from the first time that we scanned this patient three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, you can lay that out uh, as well there uh, with the vessel density. Uh, you can also do it, as you can see right here with the retinal nerve fiber layer. Notice again, the box is not checked on the reference database here, the RDB, the reference database. That's why there's no colors here. If you're saying, why is there not colors? Just check that box right there and there would be colors uh, and that would look very nice. So again, you've got your AngioView disc trend analysis as well. Clinical application. You can't know, let's take a look at the printout and just take a nice thorough overview of this printout. You can't know what abnormal is until you know what normal is. So you gotta know what normal is. Here is a nice normal, again, this is a glaucoma lecture. So we're focusing on the nerve. We're not focusing on the retina or the macula in this lecture, but here is a beautiful, normal, perfect angio view disc, the combo report. We've got an OU report here, both eyes. And let's go through this again. This is, this is a normal printout. Notice we've got our fundus photo. Again, your technician, you can, when you go through the protocols, there's going to be able to different protocols. I want to do a macular scan. I want to do an optic nerve head scan. I want to do an angio view of the retina. I want to do an angio view of the disc. I want to take a fundus photo. I want to do pachymetry, whatever it is. But obviously the box has been checked here to take a fundus photo. So we've got the right eye uh, fundus photo right here. We've got the left eye fundus photo uh, right over here. So we'll start. There's the photo. Just below that, we've got the ganglion cell analysis uh, right here. Um, shame on me, I don't have the box checked. Again, I would like this deviation map box checked so we can see the deviation. It's not, um, but there's your ganglion cell thickness right there. Um, here is our RNFL thickness, the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. Uh, we've got the good RDB, the reference database boss checked. So we got colors here and we can see this is a nice normal. We are within the greens for the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. Um, you can see our HEMI report for the retinal nerve fiber layer right here in the right eye and right here in the left eye, followed by the quadrant analysis and the quadrant analysis right eye and left eye. So looking at our retinal nerve fiber layer, looks great, followed by the vessel density. You can see the, um, the radial peripapillary capillary density. That's what RPC stands for, radial peripapillary capillary density. And you can see the nice picture, the qualitative data uh, right here, followed by the, the table, which is right here telling you the, the percentage of vessel density around the disc, superior, inferior, average, 
and then the whole image. So you can see your nice normal report. Fundus photos look great. The RNFL thickness looks great right here and right here in the left eye. The quadrant and hemi analysis looks great in both eyes. And then obviously, give me some numbers. I want to see the overall number, 94 in both eyes, nice in the normal range, superior, inferior. Is there any eye difference? And then your optic nerve head analysis and your ganglion cell analysis. Some of the key words or key data that I look at. I want to know the disc area. The average disc area on an OCT is 1.76. How did I get that? pi r squared area the formula is pi r squared what's the diameter of the disc 1.5 millimeters on average what's the radius then 0.75 millimeters so if you do pi r squared if you do that math it's 1.76 millimeters squared so i look at that number just to see am i dealing with a big disc or am I dealing with a small disc? Yes, you can eyeball it, and you can get very good at eyeballing it, going, that's a big disc, that's a small disc, that's an average size, di size disc. But I always do glance at that just to get an OCT confirmation of whether this disc is big, medium size, or average size, or smaller. So there's your disc area, your cup to disc ratio that the OCT is estimating, your ganglion cell analysis, as you can see here, and then lastly, your vessel density, peripapillary vessel density, Nice, normal report. It's giving you everything. It's giving you the RNFL. It's giving you the ganglion cells. It's giving you the vessel density around the nerve. This looks perfect. Let's compare this to and, uh, case number one. And you see this uh, just on this case here. Obviously, you take a look at the fundus photos in the top left and the top right. Obviously, we've got some increased cupping, right eye worse than the left eye, a little vertical elongation of the cup, especially uh, in that right eye. Looks like that inferior rim is thin based on the photos. And take a look at your deviation map of the RNFL. We've got inferior thinning right eye, inferior thinning left eye, corresponds with the wedge defect that you see here uh, and here. And notice we've got these both boxes checked, which is what I prefer We've got the reference database for the RNFL, and we've got the deviation map on the ganglion cells. Obviously, we've got significant deviation from normal in the ganglion cells, inferiorly in both eyes, uh, as you can see here. So obviously, we've got a glaucoma patient with a wedge defect, matches the ganglion cells. Uh, we've got thinning of the RNFL in the table, um, and we've got ganglion cell thinning. And notice we've got some vessel density thinning as well in the picture where does the vessel densities look most thin or most capillary dropout in that inferior there so again just a quick reading of little case number one the oct printout case number two again this one's more borderline uh not as again not that the last one was terrible but certainly we've got some glaucomatous changes on this oct case number two uh you take a look at this and Nerves, not terrible. Um, we've made the, it's flagging some mild changes, superior and inferior in the right eye and the left eye. Again, the, the deviation map, again, just potentially a little thin, uh, inferior in the left eye and superior and inferior in the right eye. Again, I would check that deviation map to see if we have any ganglion cell deviation there. Again, not as bad as this one. This may be a debatable one. We have no perfect test in glaucoma. I would want to know what the visual field looks like, what's the IOP history, what's the family history, what's the corneal thickness, maybe the ERG, things like that. I'd be adding it up, but certainly a little bit of a suspicious OCT here, and we would add up our entire puzzle to make a call on that one. So let's uh, anterior segment stuff. Don't forget about anterior segment. We've talked about OCT and OCT angiography. Beautiful images of the anterior segment, uh, past limbus to limbus. You can see this just beautiful picture here to be able to measure those anterior chamber angles. Do we have an open angle plate patient? Do we have a narrow angle patient? Do they have plateau iris syndrome, plateau iris configuration, things like that? Um, I use this during our uh, laser clinic for laser peripheral iridotomies, patients that are sent in with narrow angles. Now we can get a nice quantitative measure the angle and it's beautiful patient education to be able to show them this is the angle that we're looking at. This is the area that we're looking at. This is normal. This is not normal. 
it's a point that I forgot to emphasize on this one. I actually have this laminated in our clinic. And so I can have this and say to a patient, this is normal. This is what it's supposed to look like. Notice all these green, it's looking great. See all these nice vessel densities here. And this is what yours look like. And then you can clearly see the difference between normal and abnormal. It's a great patient education tool as you're talking to your glaucoma patients, again, whether they're open angle or whether they're narrow angle. So a nice view here. I don't do this, but this can be done as well. This helps to assist with scleral lens fitting. When those scleral lenses, again, I know nothing about scleral lenses. That's what my wife does all day long, fitting contact lenses. Um, but seeing are those scleral lenses landing where they should land, uh, limbus to limbus, sclera to sclera. So certainly you can image scleral lenses with that as well. Your pachymetry map. Getting a nice view of the entire uh, area of the pachymetry. Epithelial mapping, it gives you a nice epithelial map. I use that in dry eye. Um, your patients that have dry eye, significant SBK can show an increase in this epithelial thickness map, irregularities in this epithelial thickness map. And it's a nice, again, educator for the patient going, yeah, I hear your eyes are dry and look how bumpy your surface is. I want this nice and smooth because a smooth surface equals nice optics going into the eye and clear vision, and look how bumpy yours is. That's why we need to take those artificial tears. It's why we need to take that cyclosporin, that lafitograss, that steroid, IPL, whatever it is. So the corneal map, giving you a beautiful corneal thickness picture, pachymetry for glaucoma, as well as an epithelial thickness map used more in dry eye uh, and things like that. So uh, we talked about the trend analysis already, so I think I've really covered uh, the trend, trend analysis and hopefully you don't see lines that are going like this, going down over time, that's flagging you. Doc, there looks like there's progression going on. So I think we've covered this so you can monitor changes uh, over time as well uh, with that. Um, retina reports, again, the topic is glaucoma optic nerve, but there's certainly, uh, I use this in diabetes all the time for retina reports, uh, where you can take a look at the retinal vessel density as well, looking for enlargement of that foveal vascular zone, capillary dropout, et cetera, et cetera. So last thing I'm going to mention before we get to the cases, uh, which are in just a bit here, your external and fundus capture. I measure, I mentioned before, this is an OCT, OCT angiography. It's a fundus camera, it's an anterior segment camera, it has external infrared, so if you flip the lid, you can do mybography uh, as well. So you've got an OCT, OCT angiography, fundus camera, anterior segment camera, mybographer, pachymeter, et cetera, et cetera. So really a one-stop shop uh, with the Solix OCT, a phenomenal instrument uh, right there. So. Couple of quick pearls, just very quickly on general OCT stuff when interpreting changes. Remember that the average RNFL and the RNFL thickness in the inferior quadrant have been reported to be the most clinically relevant RNFL parameters. So when I'm looking at an OCT, I look at a lot of different things, but I pay attention to that average RNFL thickness and that inferior quadrant, inferior nasal, inferior temporal, looking at that. The literature shows those are the most relevant for diagnosis and progression. A change of more than nine microns may alert you to is there early damage or is there uh, progression. Nine microns between the two eyes, that's a red flag for they should be symmetrical. If they're not symmetrical, nine microns, uh, that could be significant in your patient. And then green disease and red disease. What does green disease mean? It means the patient is green on the OCT, but just because they're in the green on the OCT does not mean, does not mean that they are normal, okay? They could be in the green, but yet they started in the high green and they are progressing through the levels of the green, from high green to the middle of the green, down to the lower end of the green, and eventually going into yellow, orange, and red there. So green disease, look for progression, as we've talked about before. Red disease, there's a lot of things that can cause patients to artificially look thin, myopia, tilted optic nerves, et cetera, et cetera. So just because they're red on the OCT does not mean they have disease. If they're red on the OCT and you think it's from myopia, tilted discs, and are seeing no progression, 
That's red disease. And again, that's I think it's why it's nice to have a more enhanced and fine reference database with green, yellow, orange, and red, eliminating some of that red disease so it doesn't scare us as much as before. So thinning due to age. Again, you can see some of the natural thinning due to age, as you can see here. Remember, there's a floor effect with the OCT. If your patient's OCT average is in the, the high 40s or the 50s, they are nearing the floor of the OCT and they can't get much thinner. Um, so for that reason, this is kind of my general rule of thumb of which test to use. When I'm managing glaucoma, if they are early glaucoma or if they are, again, they don't have much disease yet, they don't have much thinning yet, I rely on the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness and the ganglion cell thickness, basically OCT, early in the course of disease, pre-parametric glaucoma, early stage glaucoma, you got to rely on the RNFL thickness, okay? When the visual field mean deviation is good, when the RNFL thickness is greater than 83, when they've got a good visual field index, the bottom line is borderline glaucoma, early glaucoma, the OCT is probably more valuable than the visual field. In advanced glaucoma, when they get really advanced glaucoma and they're reaching that floor effect on the OCT, now, and that visual field is really bad, mean deviation less than 10, when they get to advanced disease, there's a point where the OCT doesn't become overly useful anymore when they get to advanced disease because they get to the floor effect. So late disease, the visual field, rely more on the visual field. So early disease, more OCT, very late disease, more visual field, and in the middle, you need both, okay? You need both the OCT and the visual field to monitor for progression there. So, all right, in my last five to seven minutes here, let's go through a case here. So case number one is a 61-year-old male, and he was sent in to me. And actually, Adam, I'm gonna, we only have five to seven minutes left, so I wanna make sure we get to some questions. So I'm gonna actually go to our second case, and I wanna go to this one this one's a little bit more debatable on this one. Okay, so I want to see what your guys' thoughts on this one in our last five minutes. So this patient was sent to us as a glaucoma suspect. Glaucoma suspect based on, well, you'll see that uh, in just a little bit. So vision was 2015 uh, in both eyes. This is a female patient. And again, we're 2015, prescription of minus four in both eyes over multiple visits. I'm talking five, six, seven visits pressure was always in the 14 to 18 range. So we're in the mid teens. So IOP looks good. However, pachymetry uh, is, is a bit thin here. As you can see those packies at 467 and 474. So pretty significantly thin in this glaucoma suspect. Again, female patient uh, right there. Here is the optic nerve in the right eye. And I'll give you a couple of seconds to take a look at the nerve in the right eye. What would you call that cup to disc ratio? And the nerve in the left eye. So right eye, left eye. Nerve in the right eye, nerve in the left eye. Okay, I'm going back, there was the right eye. I called this cup to disc ratio about a 0.4 to four or five in the vertical meridian there. And in the left eye, I called this a, a 0.55 to six. I thought the left cup was a little bit bigger than the right cup. Maybe you agree with that, maybe you disagree, but I think most of you would agree that the left cup looks a little bit bigger than the right cup. There's the visual fields. Take a look at the 24-2 visual fields, okay? So obviously we've got a nice mean deviation, it's better then 2.5. So again, OCT is going to be very valuable to detect maybe even your wellness scan. As you do your wellness scan, do we have pre-parametric glaucoma here? Again, visual fields look great uh, at this point. I will comment that it says low test reliability. This patient was perfectly fixated right where she needed to be. Um, so I don't believe those fixation losses. This was a great visual field and it looked awesome. OCTs over the years. I've been seeing this patient for close to 15 years now. So here's some previous versions of OCTs. And you take a look at these OCTs. Again, remember the average RNFL and the inferior quadrant have shown to be 
maybe the most important to look at. Look at asymmetry. Is there a nine micron or more difference between the two eyes? The literature guides us to nine microns or more between the two eyes. That could be an early, a trigger for early glaucoma diagnosis. So obviously these OCTs are from quite some time ago. Here is the most recent OCT. And I'll give you a couple of seconds to digest this one. And we've got our angioview disc combo OU report, meaning we've got our RNFL, our ganglion cells, and our vessel density. Uh, shame on me when I printed this. I didn't check the box here. Again, I would want to see those colors on this one. But let me tell you, um, on the disc cube report, I did check the box. So you can see the colors there. So these two printouts... The Angioview Disc Combo Report and the Disc Cube Combo Report are the exact same report. The only difference is one has vessel density in it, OCTA, and one does not. So this one does not have OCT angiography. It doesn't have that radial peripapillary capillary network density. Okay, that capillary density. This one does not have it. This one does have it. Okay, so that's the difference there. But again, you can see overall, there's no major deviation um, on the RNFL on these top two. Maybe some, you know, um, slight changes here. You go to the the reference database here. It looks pretty good in both eyes. Pretty good in both eyes. Ganglion cells. Um, there's a little bit of deviation, more so in the left eye compared to the right eye. Our RNFL analysis here looks good in the right, at least green in the right, I should say. Uh, borderline superior in the left eye. And again, then you take a look at your tables as well. Average number 81 and 75. Compare the two uh, superior and inferior. There's our optic nerve head analysis, small discs. There's what the OCT is calling those cups uh, right there. Ganglion cell analysis and vessel density. Again, there's your, there's your total report here. There's the report, same report with no vessel density. And there's your retina report. I'm going to skip by that one uh, since we're talking more nerve here. And then there is your pachymetry. Confirms our, again, 465, roughly central corneal thickness. Uh, optic disc photo from just a couple of weeks ago when I saw this patient. There's the photos with the Solix. Uh, left eye and the right. There's the right eye, and I think we'd agree that left eye looks a little bit more cupped uh, there. They put both of them uh, there. So I'm going to ask you, what is your diagnosis and plan at this point? In our last couple of minutes, last poll that we're going to do, let me quickly review again. This is a 42-year-old female. I didn't tell you the age before, but 42-year-old female. There's the vision. There's the prescription. Pressures are always in the mid-teens, thin corneas. You saw the nerves. You saw the clear visual fields, which she still has clear visual fields. You saw the most recent OCT. There's the most recent OCT. Ganglion cell analysis. Again, visual fields are clear. Pachymetry. There's the photos. All right, Adam, let's open it up. What is your diagnosis and plan at this point? Let's open up the polling. All right, so here we go. And you can see our options here. Again, our last polling question, your, is this glaucoma? And at this point, you would start treatment. Is this patient a glaucoma suspect? And you would continue to monitor? Or do you think those cups are just a little bit bigger? Um, and you would release this patient from being a glaucoma suspect. Maybe a little bit of that red on the ganglion cell and the yellow on the RNFL is from red disease or yellow to maybe it's because she's a minus four so or do you think this is something else again 42 year old female i think that adds a layer to of it her age 42 years old pressures in the mid-teens but she's thin on the cornea 460 465 somewhere in there here's the beauty about asking a question like this i don't know that there's any wrong answers uh, on this because glaucoma is not black and white there's a lot of gray uh, in this here. So, um, Adam, let's hear the percentages. What do you think, or what are you seeing on what percent put A versus B versus C? I'm guessing very few put something else, um, but what's our top three? Okay, so 15% said they would start treatment. 
Okay. Seven, Seventy-eight percent said that they were a suspect, so continue to monitor. And six percent said cupping, and two percent said something else. Yeah. So the vast majority, I think you said seventy-eight percent, uh, right in the middle, going. You know what? Let's watch it, and that is okay. It is okay to be in the fence in glaucoma. It's why I would really encourage you to repeat the visual field, repeat those OCT scans, especially if you, and let's say some of you have an Avante or you have a previous OCT, a different OCT, and now you get the Solex, obviously that's a new instrument. Um, get a couple of scans, get a few scans, bring them back in three to six months and repeat the scan and repeat it again. So now you're establishing new scans on your new instrument so you can detect change over time. I think it's a great option to watch this. That's exactly what I'm doing uh, in this particular case. This is actually, this patient's a 42 year old optometrist, colleague of mine locally here in the area. Uh, she's a vision therapy and uh, infant vision specialist. And I've been just watching her glaucoma for 10, 12 years. She has a family history. Um, she's obviously well-educated because she's an optometrist. I'm holding at this point. I'm watching just like the 78% of you, getting more information, repeating the field, checking the pressure again, repeating those scans and watching this very closely to see if we see any signs of progression uh, going forward. So that's what our diagnosis and plan is going forward uh, in this one here. So um, I need to take control again. Yeah, I'm going to skip through these. With that, I think, Adam, we are 45 minutes in, um, and I think we've reached the end of our lecture, and it's time for a five to 10 minute Q&A. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Nate. And for everyone who has questions, you can see on the right side of your screen, there's a little box there that says questions. Uh, feel free to type questions into that box, and we'll go over them verbally. And by the way, uh, if you fail to ask questions tonight or we don't get around to your question, an archive of this webinar will be posted on ODWire and you can always post questions there. Uh, and again, we're going to be replaying this at CWire as well this weekend. So you might want to jump in there and ask questions. Um, so I guess let me uh, pull out my question box here and <laughs> we can get started with it. So I got to make it nice and big so I can actually see it. Um, so let's see. A uh, question here, <clears throat> can you do montage and fundus photos? Uh, question is, is, can you do fundus photos? The answer is yes. Um, I haven't used the montage uh, figure uh, just yet on that. Um, so I'd have to kick that to, to Rachel or Sierra. I'm not sure if you can montage uh, on this or not. I haven't used that yet. Um, we actually, because the fundus photos aren't new, we didn't have to do that in the clinical trials. Um, so that wasn't part of our two clinical trials that we did for the FDA. Um, so it takes a very nice photo. Um, I would have to um, ask uh, Rachel or Sierra, I'm gonna have to look at that, see if we can montage. I don't know if we can uh, on that one. Okay. We, if it, oh, we do not go. montage. No. Yes, I don't we believe do so. I wasn't photos. Sure. Yes yep. to OCTA montage, but no to fundus. Yeah, no to fundus photo montage. Yep. Yes, correct. Great. And let's see. Uh, so question here, what change in thickness uh, in, in GCC per year is, is physiologic versus pathological? So is there a number that you can throw out there that you can determine, you know, change in thickness? Yep. Let me, I skipped by this slide just for time purposes because we were running uh, a little bit behind on that, but I, I, you, I think you can see the, here's my, my kind of general summary slide for the ganglion cell thickness, and you can see kind of the normal range. And again, every, one, every machine is a little bit different, um, but kind of your average thickness in normal subjects versus where it goes in early versus moderate versus advanced disease, your change with aging, uh, as you can see here, you know, in 30 years, you should change about 10 microns. Many patients start in the high 80s, uh, if not even the 90s. So you shouldn't get into the 60s or 50s. Um, but that's that's kind of the what, what I look at when it comes to the ganglion cell analysis and ganglion cell thickness uh, when it comes to OCT. Uh, of note, the floor is a little bit lower. Uh, the floor is a little bit lower. Um, 
uh, yeah, with the ganglion cells compared to the RNFL. So whereas the RNFL, the floor is again about 50, 55. And once you get there, the RNFL loses a little bit of its usefulness. Ganglion cell, it's a little bit lower uh, at an average of about 45. So that advanced glaucoma, you can still follow with OCT and ganglion cell uh, becomes a little bit more uh, advantageous in that one. Right. Uh, interesting question here. Um, in your experience, how often do you see progression on the OCTA only? So you don't see any changes to the nerve fiber layer or fields or anything like that, just on OCTA? Yeah, it's a good question. And I'm going to give you my early experience, um, which is, again, we are just learning on this. In my experience, they correlate pretty well. And I've seen some patients where the vessel density changes um, before the RNFL. You know, is glaucoma a vascular disease? And I think the we all think the answer is yes. Um, there's a there's multifactorial. It's intraocular pressure. It's vascular related, among other factors. Um, I have seen some patients where the vessel density is changing before the RNFL. I do think it's a uh, it's something we want to look at, and we're learning more and more and more uh, about this. So that's why I'm really gl glad we now have FDA cleared metrics for vessel density around the disc. So I look at that and I'm still learning about it. We're in our infancy uh, of really learning and understanding those vessel density metrics, because this is the first company that's had FDA cleared metrics. We've had pictures for a lot of times, but we all, you know, pictures are nice. Qualitative data is nice, but you want numbers in glaucoma. I want numbers as well so we can see progression over time. So yeah, it's a great question and the answer is yes, and we're still learning on it. Right. And uh, getting back to the, <clears throat> excuse me, to the case that we went through, a uh, question here about management. So what would you think uh, of the option of SLT on the patient's left eye because yeah. of the GCC thinning? Yep. I'm, I, um, I practice in, in, um, in Oklahoma. You guys have probably heard me lecture on, on laser before, Adam, I think I did a lecture for you, you know, back in February we, on, on CE wire um, yep. on laser and SLT you know, you never want to say never in medicine. Um, so I'm not going to say never, but SLT is as close to never a bad idea um, in a case like this. Unless your patient has significant, you know, angle recession, has inflammatory glaucoma, has very narrow angle. If this patient is an open angle glaucoma suspect or a low tension glaucoma suspect, or even if you called it ocular hypertension because of those thin corneas, would SLT be a bad idea in this case? Absolutely not. Um, you guys are probably familiar with the light study uh, that was released in 2019. They just updated their data. Uh, they have now six year data and they showed that and they had a huge number of patients, 300 plus patients that went down the prostaglandin arm and 300 patients that went down the SLT arm. And they showed that patients were more likely to progress on drops less likely to progress on SLT after six years. And isn't that what it's about, all about, is delaying progression, preventing progression, so we can save our patient's vision. They were less likely to progress on SLT. So your reward is just so great, and the risk is just so very low. So I think that would be a, a great plan, whoever asked that question. Could you consider an SLT on the left eye? Absolutely, you could consider that in the left eye, yes. Right. Uh, interesting question here. Um, how many patients did it take to create that normative database? Yeah, it's a good question. And I'll, I'll let somebody answer after I give the answer. Um, when I We were one of five locations um, for uh, the reference database development. And again, normative database, reference database, to me, in my mind, they're the same thing. The normative database, we had to recruit a bunch of patients from the age of 20 to the age of 85 plus, um, and it was a bunch of normals, and we, in our site, had 125 patients. So if uh, we were one of five sites, so you can do the math, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patients uh, to create that reference database. So if anybody wants to comment on top of that, please do so. Great. And a question here, uh, this particular person has an OptiView OCT, a fundus camera, and a mybographer, and they're all standalone units. Uh, compare and contrast, how fast uh, 
is the acquisition with the Solix mm-hmm. versus you know the standalone units? Yeah, um, I have I have the Avante again. I've had it for seven or eight years. Uh, we have my biography. Um, and what was the other one you said that was it OCT, my biography and, and fundus photos. Um, yeah, it, the scan acquisition is in my clinical opinion, light years quicker. Like I, in this case, I, I did all of these. I mean, we did OC, I just did this a couple of weeks ago and we did fundus photos. We did angio view of the retina. We did angio view of the disc. We did a retina scan. We did pachymetry, as you can see here. And again, we took fundus photos, as you can see. And you can do all of those in a matter of, depending on the patient and your technician, how good they are. You can do all of those in about a minute and a half to two and a half, three minutes per eye. Because they're all right in there. They never leave the chin rest. And it's, and you view the disc, and you view the retina, retina map put the lens on to do the, the pachymetry stuff. It, I, it's so much quicker than walking them to different instruments. So scan acquisition is huge to be able to just boom, 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 boom. We got all of them in the right eye. Let's switch to the left eye. Boom, 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 boom. And we're done. Great. And it looks like we are just coming up on an hour right now. So Nate, thank you for doing all this. And I want to actually give a link. Whoops, I'll put it right here. Uh, at the end here to show people where they can go to learn more information uh, about Solix. So if you go to visionics.com slash US slash ODYR, you can get straight to our page uh, there. Um, and obviously, if you're watching this webinar on demand, just scroll down a little bit <laughs> and you'll see links beneath the show and we'll take you right there as well. So Nate, thanks again for coming out and, th- and thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Again, if you have more questions, uh, this lecture will be available on demand. We'll put it up on ODWire. Feel free to ask your questions there and uh, we can have a little back and forth. So uh, so thanks again. And I, and I guess, Nate, we'll catch up with you soon online. Sounds good. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy your evening. Bye, everyone.